what we'll try and do is some background, talk about what we do currently in the acute setting, because I think it's important that we're all aware of what we do currently in the acute setting. I'm not going to show you a lot of clinical trial data. I'm going to show you some local data, some where we are currently on our management of acute coronary syndromes nationally, and it's good, uh, and talk about secondary prevention and the importance of secondary prevention, and use some cases to illustrate, um, have some discussion, really, because you'd be sick of hearing me talk pretty quickly. Good news, we are in a good place with ischemic heart disease from where we were 50 years ago when the Heart Foundation uh, came in, when it, was, when it was born really. In 1968 we had a peak of coronary disease. One in two New Zealanders smoked, okay? So one in two people in this room would be smoking probably during this lecture actually. Uh, and <laughs> but it's reduced by about two-thirds since. And it's probably 50-50 about what happens at a public health level, primary prevention level, and what we do when we see someone who comes through the front door with an ischemic heart disease presentation. But it's still important. And um, I'll just go back. These curves are actually flattening. And again, in some countries around the world, these tails are starting to come up the other side. Okay. Also in New Zealand, we've got inequity of outcomes now. Yes, Māori and Pacific have come down, but not to the same degree as Pākehā. We could, sh we could show a similar graph for elderly. We could show a similar graph for depriva you know, deprivation status in New Zealand. And we see that there is a spread. So it's not, it shouldn't sit well with us, and it doesn't sit well with us. And it's not just for ischemic heart disease. It's around anything we would talk about in the cardiovascular not just the cardiovascular disease space, any, most things that we would talk about. But one in three of us will still die a cardiovascular death, that's heart, heart attack or stroke. Ischemic heart disease itself is still responsible for 16% of deaths. But people don't present with an ischemic heart disease presentation, they present to you and I with a suspected ischemic heart disease presentation, an acute coronary syndrome presentation or more chronic chest discomfort. So chest pain presentations are responsible for up to 10% of ED presentations internationally and around the country. Less than a third of them will have ischemic heart disease. And 2 to 4% of people with suspected acute coronary syndrome historically have been sent home. And that's with a significant um, adverse outcome with a 2% 30-day mortality for people with missed acute coronary syndromes. So here's a case, and this is a 58-year-old man who presents to one of the surgeries in town, or one of the surgeries anywhere around, around, around the country. He's had intermittent indigestion-like discomfort for three days, history of labile hypertension, don't know what that means, but his blood pressure's been up and down a little bit, but, but he's not on any treatment for it specifically with a family history of ischemic heart disease. So what else do you want to know? So no radiation of symptoms. His chest wall's got mild tenderness to palpation. He's got no, no associated symptoms of sweatiness with the chest discomfort. Mm, no. So what are you going to do? I think historically what you, what I would suggest most of the general practitioners in the room would have done. They'd have seen this man, they think this may or may not be ischemic chest pain. You'd have done some troponins, possibly waited for the troponins to come back, uh, done an ECG, and maybe sent him for an outpatient appointment. Yeah, I think. I don't think you'd have sent someone like this to hospital with those symptoms. But what we've done is we've introduced structure around chest pain assessment in New Zealand. And certainly people in the Midland region who work here, uh, certainly Nareesh, you'll have seen this working in Morrinsville. This is the, the accelerated chest pain pathway that Tim Norman and others have been leading that involves this structured assessment with an EDAX clinical assessment tool. So basically, this is populated by a number of variables, including conventional risk factors and also the symptoms. Now, you'd argue, well, why do we need to do this? 
Well, we need to do it because I don't think we take history well enough and it's reinforcing the importance of history. So as you can see here, you, t you get negative scores here. You get points deducted if it is pleuritic or if it's reproduced by palpation. Okay, so it's making us think about the chest discomfort. The entry point to all of these pathways is chest pain of suspected ischemic origin. Okay? Now, biomarkers are really important. They're an integral part of this, as is the ECG. So we would recommend biomarkers. Currently, we're doing biomarkers at two hours. Uh, initially at two hours and then two hours later. And this is an evolving science. The biomarkers have been done earlier and earlier, and there's, there's stuff going on overseas saying just do one biomarker. If the first troponin's negative, the EDAX is low, you don't need to send that patient to hospital. But we've added structure to this, and this chap would end up having a, a low EDAX score. So his EDAX score is eight, and we would not send this, we would not recommend this guy sent up to hospital. So really important, in rural New Zealand, we're not sending this guy all the way from the top of Coromandel down to Waikato or Thames Hospital for assessment. He was referred because of the concern about his family history for a treadmill test, which was done a couple of weeks later. But again, just to emphasize how the, how the, the, why the EDAX bit of the score is important to us. So we, we're, we're a little bit concerned about just going with a biomarker assessment of chest pain. So if this guy's got an exertional component and there's no tenderness, his score changes, okay? His score is now 21. So we're recommending that he is seen, regardless of what the troponins are, so he is non-low risk. He is referred to cardiology or local rural hospital, and he had a treadmill test performed prior to discharge, okay? So it's an important, it's adding structure around the assessment of chest pain. And what this has also done, so this is rolled out around the country uh, in our ED departments and cardiology departments, general medicine departments. When you phone up, this common language has been, been spoken. So I've seen a 55-year-old man, his EDAX score is 22. That triggers, well, we've got to see him. It should trigger that response. So again, the extension of the work we've done with this, and this is led with Martin Tan uh, through the networks, we're all involved with the, with the ongoing work with this, with the research projects, is now rolling this out into rural primary care, rural hospitals. And the intent is, is to get the right person at the right place at the right time and not send people where they don't need to be. And I think this is really an important um, improvement in the way that we're able to assess people with suspected acute coronary syndromes. So moving on to how we diagnose coronary disease, it's changing. So we do more and more CTs. We perform procedures via the, the really large more often than not. The guidelines are changing overseas. So in the UK, uh, the NICE guidelines would suggest if you or I are seeing someone with typical or atypical symptoms of angina, that your go-to test, the vast majority of patients, is a CT coronary angiogram. Now, they would like to be able to do an FFR CT. That's great. There's a supercomputer in California does that. Nobody's got any access to it currently, so that's not a reality currently. <laughs> but we've got more and more CTs around the country. So I think this is a reality, and certainly how our pathways are evolving in terafity uh, around CT. Just to remind you, shouldn't have to, but remind you, these are the typical features of someone with suspected angina. Exertional component, discomfort, constricting discomfort in the neck, arms, and prompt relief by rest or GTM. But this is how, the, 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 this is how NICE define typical to non-anginal chest pain. Okay, so that's the, the entry point for that algorithm for direct access to CT rather than exercise tolerance testing. There is some science to support this, and this is based on this trial, the Scott Hart trial, uh, performed out of Edinburgh. One of the investigators in this trial is a young cardiologist called Phil, Phil, Adams, Phil Adamson, who's now back as a Heart Foundation senior fellow. He's back as a cardi cardiologist in Christchurch. So some of this work is ongoing, and the relationship with Edinburgh continues to develop with other research as well. So what they looked at was usual care versus giving access, direct access to CT. 
And what they show, as you would predict, and these are people presenting with suspected angina in an outpatient setting, so this is not an ED se setting, that the diagnosis changed in a quarter of patients in the CT group compared with usual care. There was a non-significant reduction in events, fatal and non-fatal MIs, and statistically at post hoc landmark analysis, that did, it did become significant. If you look at the probability of coronary artery disease, this perhaps should not surprise us. So as we get older, the likelihood of you or I having coronary artery disease increases. So if you look at a, how old are you, Bruce? <laughs> if you look at a, a man between 60 and 69, even without chest discomfort, you've got almost a 50% chance of having coronary artery disease of some degree. But if you're then presenting with typical angina, it increases quite significantly. If we follow Scott Hart out to five years, we see a significant five-year follow-up, a 41% reduction in death or non-fatal MI in patients who were allocated randomized to the CT group. Benefits driven predominantly by non-fatal MI. What do you think the reason for that is? Not necessarily. So revascularization, there was a bit more revascularization, but, but not dramatically so. So not just statins. Prevention, isn't it? So what you're doing is you may be, you know, the CT may identify disease that doesn't need intervention to, but it reinforces to you and I that we need, to, and to the patient, that we need to take prevention much more seriously. So statins were, were used more, were more commonly in this group as well. They were more likely to be treated to target. They're more likely to receive aspirin. Acute coronary syndromes. So we, acute coronary syndrome is a spectrum really that stems from unstable angina through to STEMI, and STEMI is the one that we, we recognize more often than not as life-threatening. It's due to, well, we'll come on to what it's, what it's due to in a second, but again, parallel to that, that introductory slide where I showed the reduction in ischemic heart disease mortality, I, I think this is phenomenal where we are and what we've achieved since the 1940s with acute myocardial infarction in hospital mortality. So in 1940, toss a coin, whether you survived or not when you came through the front door, compared to today, um, where, you know, four, four to five percent chance of dying during your acute ST segment elevation uh, admission. And we, you know, we still strive for better with this, which is great. It's great. But that's the, that's the pathophysiology that we're talking about. And the pathophysiology is similar, be it STEMI, non-STEMI, or unstable angina. You've got a plaque that's vulnerable. For whatever reason, that plaque's ruptured. And that ruptured plaque then triggers lots of things. The coagulation system is triggered. You get platelet activation. You get thrombus activation. You get thrombus plugs formed. And you get that breaking down with your endogenous lytic system activated and you get distal embolization. So that happens. So why, why, do, why, do, why do people not all present the same? I ask this question to medical students as well, and there's silence as well usually. <laughs> exactly. So we don't all come to the party dressed the same way, do we? So, so pe some people may have established coronary disease, um, some people may not have established coronary disease, and that's where that plaque rupture, you know, in a young 40-year-old woman who does not have established collaterals, they rupture a plaque in an LAD, that is likely to be devastating and potentially fatal for that individual. Whereas an older person that's got established disease with collaterals, the impact of that may be less dramatic for that patient. But the spectrum is um, from STEMI through to unstable angina. 
our treatment options continue to expand. So we've got a myriad of treatments and we continue to look at novel treatments and different combinations. Uh, but, but basically what we're trying to do is it's, a, it's balancing with our treatment. It's the trying to reduce the ischemic risk but al and also by, by reducing the ischemic risk we're trying to reduce the risk of thrombosis, so turning off the coagulation system to a large degree, platelets and uh, thrombus formation. But the balance of that really, it, it's, a, it's a difficult balance because when we do all that, what we're, what we're doing is increasing the bleeding risk. So trying to get that right can be complex. If we look at our own data in New Zealand, and this is acute coronary syndromes, and this is, this is recent ANZAC data, so this is our national registry. If we look at mortality out to 2017, we've had a 28% reduction in admissions with acute coronary syndrome since 2006. So it doesn't matter what populations that we look in, uh, Pacific, Māori, Asians, they're all coming down. But, but again, note the difference. Why do we still have this gap? We need to understand why we've got that gap and try and bridge that gap. What we also see in the last two years is a flattening of all of these curves. So I think at currently with our current therapeutic options, including primary prevention, we're probably as good as we're going to get with this. And there's currently around 6,000 admissions per annum in New Zealand with an acute coronary syndrome. Angiography. Angiography is a really important bit of what we do when someone comes through the front door with an acute coronary syndrome. We want to know if people will benefit from revascularization. And it's been a national target for the last 10 years. And our angiography rates have increased significantly as well, 21%. But again, why is it different for Māori and Pacific? This is something that we, we actually control. Someone comes through the front door. We, you know, we, we actually decide who, who gets an angiogram, who doesn't. I don't believe in our practice we're, making dis we're discriminating when we're seeing someone with an acute coronary syndrome about which patient should or should not have a, a, uh, an angiogram. Probably we're still not referring these people for angiograms or they're not presenting. So I think that's something that we need to work on as well. So a case. This is a 64-year-old truck driver who's had chest discomfort on and off for a wee while. His biomarkers go up a little bit, so it's consistent with a myocardial infarction. Medications he was on prior to coming into hospital, only on one, one agent for blood pressure. That's not good, is it? Who's the cardiologist looking after him? <laughs> So he gets reasonably good therapy uh, for his acute coronary. Are you okay with me doing this way? Uh, his acute coronary syndrome admission. He gets an angiogram done. It must have been a Waikato. He got it done within two days, eh? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Pretty good? Pretty good, isn't it? And his right coronary artery is normal as well. I, I would suggest there's maybe a little bit of irregularity in that LAD, but it's, 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 it's pretty good. So just to remind you, the, the infarcts that you and I see on a day-to-day -day basis are type 1 usually. So this is where you've got atherosclerotic plaque, the one that we they talked about. The plaque has ruptured. You get all the activation of all the bits and bobs, atherothrombotic. But we've also got this entity called type 2 that I think we're actually recognizing a little bit more. We're seeing a little bit more of it. Why? Because we've got better at picking it up. This is this imbalance between oxygen demand and supply. And it's not related. The, the really important thing is not related to acute coronary artery thrombosis. Um, things that are associated with type 2 myocardial infarction more likely to see in women than men. The mortality appears to be slightly higher than type 1 myocardial infarctions. And that's because a lot of these people have other co comorbidities, be it renal failure, be it chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. There's lots of other things that actually are not good to have. So it increases their mortality when they have a type 2 myocardial infarction. 
Atrial fibrillation is a common reason that we would see people with a type 2 myocardial inf infarct admitted to our wards. Um, coronary artery disease, you may see it, but it's not the pathophysiological reason for the presentation. We now talk about this entity as well, myocardial infarction with uh, minimal or non-obstructive coronary artery disease. And we've looked at this in New Zealand. Yes, it occurs, about 15% of people younger, more likely to be Māori and Pacific, more likely to be female, less likely to receive evidence-based care on discharge. If we look at outcomes here, their outcome is not as bad as people with obstructive coronary disease, but it's not as good as people that have got no prior cardiovascular disease. So again, it's a group of patients that we need to understand a little bit more about what to do. So with this chap, we actually had a, a look at his coronaries with some uh, OCT, and he does have plaque in there, look, that little irregular bit. So our recommendation with the troponin rise in elevation was to recommend evidence-based care for an acute coronary syndrome, which is what we would recommend at anybody that's got that troponin rise and fall in this setting. 12 months. Questions? I'll do this case and then we're gonna, we maybe have some questions. This is, this is a 48-year-old uh, lady who's had chest pain for five days. Again, small troponin rise and fall. The ECG was unremarkable. Labile hypertension. I use, that, I use that term a lot, don't know what I mean. But, but what do you think is going on? So what have I highlighted there? I've hidden it there. I've highlighted it there. So this, this, this I believe we're diagnosing much more frequently as our imaging has got better. It allows us to pick up um, small little tears in the coronary arteries here. So this is the condition called SCAD. That's a very topical condition, spontaneous, spontaneous coronary artery dissection. So what that is, is a little tear in that coronary artery that's been responsible for the troponin elevation and the lady's presentation with chest discomfort. So it's, it's increasingly recognized as a cause of presentations in young to middle-aged women. Maybe some relationship to female hormones. We don't fully understand that. I think this is important, and I don't think we do this nearly as much as we should, we should think about other things that may be associated with non-coronary arteriopathies such as fibromuscular dysplasia. There is an increased incidence. So should we be imaging the renal arteries, for example, for FMD? And some people would recommend we do that routinely. I think our practice is certainly not in New Zealand to go looking for this uh, routinely. It doesn't appear to be inherited, and the presence of significant coronary disease is quite uncommon. Long-term prognosis is good with this, but people keep coming back. And it's not infrequent for people to come back with chest discomfort to see you, to see us, and get readmitted with it. But the prognosis tends to be good. The thing for cardiologists to record, is to recognize this is not to put stents in. Okay? You recognize this and you put a stent in, that dissection can extend all the way back, and we've had a couple of disasters in Waikato when I worked there, where arteries have been stented right back to the left main, and one patient, one young lady died, and one young lady ended up having bypass grafting with us keeping chasing stuff. So certainly, most interventions learn, unfortunately, by doing it the first time, and then they'll not do it again, stenting a spontaneous coronary artery dissection. But again, it's topical. Uh, you'll see people with discharge diagnosis of SCAD, so I thought it was worth discussing this with you today and highlighting it. Just a couple of words about ST segment elevation MI. Nothing new has changed in what we're recommending. If you can get to a PCI capable center within 120 minutes, you should get to, you should be transferred to a PCI capable center. If you cannot, patients should not be denied the benefits of thrombolysis, okay? So it's really important. Um, and that's been emphasized in our New Zealand out of hospital STEMI pathway. The good thing about this is working with St. John's, we're bringing everybody together, and St. John's have been uh, 
pretty pivotal about trying to rule out the STEMI pathway around the country. So what the next step with this that's happened currently in a number of our regions is St. John's facilitating community thrombolysis, uh, fibrinolysis, and direct transfer to a PCI capable center. Okay, so that means not coming to Rotorua, not coming to Gisborne. If you're lysed up the coast, you will go straight to Waikato. The reason being is that one in three people do not reperfuse post lytic, and there's no benefit to that patient sitting in Tarafati to wait to see if he or she declares his hand. He's, they're better off in a PCI capable centre. So that's been a bit of a stop start process, but we're, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. We're getting there. Non ST segment elevation events, they remain the most frequent reason for admission with an acute coronary syndrome, but they are coming down as well. Good, but again, like all ACS, I think we've plateaued where we are with this. Reflection probably of our aging population and the burden of this in our aging population. Revascularization is an integral part of the management of people with non ST segment elevation events, despite what some of our colleagues in this region might think it is an important bit of what we do. We identify people early who benefit, benefit from revascularization. Admittedly, the evidence base around the mortality benefit is not great, but we prevent people having recurrent events. We prevent re recurrent MIs coming back to hospital. And if you select the high-risk populations defined in this analysis of eight meta-analysis of eight trials, their high-risk patients elevated markers, uh, diabetes, a, a GRACE risk score, which is one of the scores we use to assess risk, or older patients, there does appear to be a mortality benefit as well. So there is evidence behind saying someone who comes in with an acute coronary syndrome, troponin positive event, should go to the cath lab during their index admission as part of their management, ideally as soon as possible, but pre-discharge. And it is happening, we're referring more people, more people are getting, I showed you the angiography one earlier, but revascularization is increasing as well, 15% since 2006, plateauing a little bit, that's probably in parallel with the population, but also I think capacity issues. I think what we need to understand though, when you present with acute coronary syndrome, it doesn't go away. So you've got coronary artery disease, cardiovascular disease. Once you present, it's a lifelong illness that you and I have to deal with and the patient has to deal with. Um, I think we often, you know, we often see patients in the clinic, you would see these patients as well, they've had a stent put in, they think, well, okay, what's the problem, doc? I'm fixed, I don't need to take these medications any longer. And I think our language needs to change around what we say to people post-procedure when we see them in the clinic. I think if we look at acute coronary syndrome specifically, at one year, 10% of people will represent to us with a further event or die. And contemporary data I saw from Menzax last week, it, it's still around 10% to 12 months in 2,000 New Zealanders. So again, if you follow people out, and this is a European study, uh, it is around 30, just under 20% at a year in the European study, but up to 30% out to four years. So people keep having events, okay? So we, what are we doing about the risk of that person to reduce those events, to hopefully try and reduce those events? We know the people that are more likely to have events here are older patients, it's the European registry. Um, if you've got if you've had prior heart failure or if you did not get revascularization. So again, we've got to identify people who benefit from revascularization and target the people at highest risk to implement subsequent events. So our aim really with secondary prevention is to reduce those subsequent events, uh, be it hospitalization, mortality, but it's to keep people living well in the community. And I think that's something that we need to, you know, work harder to do as a group. And primary care has a really important role in all of this. In fact, I would suggest that this is primary, this is in the domain of primary care. I actually, um, well, I'm among friends, but 
I think cardiac rehab should not be based in hospitals. I think cardiac rehab, and what is cardiac rehab? I think cardiac rehab it needs to be renamed into secondary prevention. I think it is best situated in primary care with interdigiting between secondary and tertiary and primary care, but best delivered by primary care. Don't have to pay for parking either. <laughs> <laughs> But I think there's, again, this has got more complex as well. It's got much more complex. I would suggest that secondary prevention begins the moment you walk through with an acute coronary syndrome. So part of the revascularization that we do, targeting you know, appropriate high-risk patients, that's all part of secondary prevention. Um, we've got a myriad of new treatments, um, new treatments potentially around the corner that we may see in New Zealand in the not too distant future. Just highlight the SGLT2 inhibitors. These are an important class of medications for type 2 diabetics uh, that dramatically reduce cardiovascular events and hospitalizations with heart failure in diabetics. I think it is over, there, it's overdue to have, for us not having access to these agents in New Zealand. If we were going to look at one drug class to bridge that equity gap, access of these agents for people with type 2 diabetics would actually improve it a lot. So I think uh, I, I'm pleased to see discussions are progressing with Pharmac around access for SGLT2s for our populations in New Zealand. So secondary prevention, uh, we need to have data. We need to have data in the right place. So collecting hospital outcome data is important, but collecting data when people or in the community post their ACS event, we don't collect a lot of data. We don't know what's going on. We have no idea how successful we are with smoking cessation post discharge. We don't know, we don't know. I think data that we collect needs to be meaningful to our patients. It's all very well me being interested in HbA1c, but what does that mean to the patients? People want to get back to work. We need to be collecting data that's important to them. I think one size of secondary prevention or cardiac rehab, it doesn't fit all. We've got to be flexible. Co-design with our patients in FANO, look at new technology, and it has to be across the, the continuum, really. And I believe best delivered in primary care. Just skip on. Um, if we look at medications, and this is part of our role as health professionals, this is um, dispensed medication, so goodness knows what happened after they're actually dispensed. But this is triple therapy uh, 12 months after people are discharged from acute coronary syndrome in 2013. The one good thing I'd say is we're all equally as bad as this around the country. So northern, midland, central, southern. But only 60% of people are taking a statin an antihypertensive agent, or dispense the statin, an antihypertensive agent, and an antiplatelet agent, you know, 12 months post an ACS admission. Why? We need to understand this better to actually improve outcomes. So we don't just do one more case. Um, can we rationalize therapy to improve compliance? So this is the chart we talked about earlier. Do we need beta blockers post ACS? Well, the data that we have, we don't have a lot of randomized data, and potentially we will be looking at a large randomized data base, a large randomized trial through the ANZAC platform in the next 12 months. But what data we do have suggests that unless your left ventricular function is impaired post an ACS admission, you probably don't need to continue the beta blocker. Okay? How long? How long? So, this, so this registry, it doesn't say when they stopped it, but there's a French registry that looked at continuing it for three months. So I would suggest up to three months and then you could maybe look at getting rid of your beta blocker to try and improve therapy. It actually mandates we assess left ventricular function and we've not been doing that particularly well post an ACS and it's one of the things that we've done with the, uh, the ANZAC QI quality improvement program. We've been reporting this over the last uh, two years and we've seen a significant improvement in assessing LV function pre-discharge to enable informed decisions about appropriate care when patients are discharged. thought I'd share this trial because I think this will be a practice changing trial. And this trial presented at TCT last month, the big North American angioplasty meeting. 
And it was a randomized trial looking at uh, dual antiplatelet therapy in a, in a high risk population undergoing angioplasty, uh, ticagalor and aspirin. And then they got rid of the aspirin in one arm versus continuing DAPT in the other arm. And what they showed was that in patients who, and the primary endpoint was bleeding. So the primary endpoint was not clinical. This was a secondary endpoint. But what they did show is that as you'd ho hopefully predict, people that got dual therapy were more likely to bleed than people that got monotherapy. So people that got ticagalor alone, 4% risk of bleed versus 7% risk of bleed. If we look at the secondary endpoint, the pri we did not see a reduction in ischemic driven endpoints in people that didn't, did not get DAP. So I think we're starting to see for the first time some sense around where we might be going with antiplatelet therapies, particularly with the more potent PY12 inhibitors such as ticagalor. Ticagalor works in almost everybody we give it to. Uh, clopidogrel doesn't. One in three people metabolize clopidogrel differently and it doesn't work. So this to me, I think we will be moving forward, I would predict, with guidelines within the next sort of three, four, five years to ticagalor as monotherapy, certainly for angioplasty post-ACS, if not all patients post-ACS, and there's ongoing trials in this as well. The polypill, Bruce mentioned the polypill. So again, can we improve, knowing compliance is important for secondary prevention, can we improve compliance by simplifying treatment with polypills? My, my beef with the polypills to date Bruce, is that they've shown improved compliance but little outcome data. And I think we've got a couple of big trials that are going to report in the ne next two years. You need such big numbers to show a difference. Yeah. That's the problem yeah. because yeah. it's active treatment versus active treatment, really. Yeah. But, but this trial, this report in the New England Journal recently, it's in a high risk, high depth population, minority population in the United States uh, where they looked at, you know, there's Lorsartan again, your favorite, one of your favorites, hydroclothiazide. So that's probably the one that you, two of the components of the one that you were using, Bruce. But they have got a calcium antagonist there as well. But what they looked at is changes in systolic blood pressure and LDL. And what they did show is they got a reduction in these endpoints. So again, if we try to join up those dots, that would suggest that this type of approach, I. I think it is something that we should be considering, not, not just in secondary prevention, but also primary prevention to reduce cardiovascular, to reduce these endpoints, which will hopefully reduce cardiovascular events. So this is a, um, an elderly man, acute coronary syndrome. You ladies have seen this case before, I think. <laughs> but, but lots of things going on. He's had AF, he's had a carotid endarterectomy, he's on a inappropriate dose of dibigatrin possibly, 150 BD with an EGFR of um, 45. He presented with an acute coronary syndrome, he had a block lima graph, we stuck a stent in, sent him home on that cocktail to reduce his risk of stent thrombosis and also stroke. We know that AF is a common problem in, in people that we see coming admitted with acute coronary syndrome. And Bruce mentioned it earlier, it is now one of the variables we put into all the calculators because of this strong association with coronary artery disease. They need intervention, the complexity of reducing the risk of stroke versus the, reducing the risk of stent thrombosis. So we end up with quite a, uh, you know, a potential cocktail for bleeding with DAPT and oral anticoagulants. Lots of things we should think about. Stent type today is, is less of an issue. We tend to put drug eluting stents in most people. Um, there's really very few people we, we would consider uh, putting a bare metal stent in preference to a drug eluting stent. The clinical presentation, that's really important. Acute coronary syndromes, the data we have for DAP is around acute coronary syndrome. So we should be looking at prolonged DAP for most of our patients with an acute coronary syndrome the duration of DAP, and then do we use a NOAC or a DOAC, warfarin, and which P2Y12 inhibitor? So look what happened, Eddie. So I, I remember this case well. I, I was bailed up in the corridor at YCAT. It's about five years ago now by Frank Wylett. If any of you know Frank, Frank's a, uh, a local gastroenterologist. And he says, 
what are you jokers doing? I've just been up all night with this guy bleeding. <laughs> Shouldn't surprise us, really. He, yes, he's got an increased risk of stroke, but his bleeding risk is really high as well. Um, so we've got guidelines around this now, uh, and these are the recent guidelines from the Cardiac Society, trying to rationalize things. So what we do know is this currently is not, there, there's no evidence base to suggest we should be using this as part of a regime with an oral anticoagulant. So t no tacargalor, no prasagrol currently. So use in combination low-dose aspirin and clopidogrel. We've got trials now telling us that it's okay to use NOACs in this situation. We've got historical data. We've also got randomized trials telling us NOACs are at least as good as warfarin as part of this combination in this complex patient population requiring uh, DAPT and an oral anticoagulant. But use the lowest dose proven to be effective. So not 150 BD for dabigatrin, not 20 milligrams for rivaroxaban, use the lower dose. Can't, so again, we've got data coming out on the benefits of an oral anticoagulant and a single agent in the longer term. But what you want to do is get your patient over that initial ischemic, high risk ischemic hump, which is around three months, okay? So at least a month, preferably three months, hopefully out to six months, unless the bleeding risk is really high, will you modify this? So again, common sense, and it's trying to drop guidelines for common sense is always difficult because you need to engage your brain. I think this is an important one for us to remember as well, that when we're looking at oral, we've got lots of patients that you and I see that have ischemic heart disease, atrial fibrillation, coming back for reviews, their last ischemic heart disease presentation may have been two, three years ago. They remain on aspirin and DAPT or aspirin and warfarin for whatever reason. The data we would have would suggest there's probably no benefit of continuing aspirin in that patient population, and we're probably exposing the patient to a risk of bleeding. So again, if you've got a stable patient that you're bringing back to the clinic or into your practice who are on an oral anticoagulant and aspirin, consider, can I stop the aspirin? because there's more harm than benefit for a lot of these patients continuing aspirin. So I think with Eddie today, what we would do in 2019, um, look at a DOAC, the Bigotrin, 110 BD, or Rivaroxaban in New Zealand, once a day, clopidogrel for 12 months, aspirin for three months to get them over that high risk hump, or maybe even one month, yep, 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 yep. One to three, well, one to three months, um, probably a miprazole to reduce the risk of the G GI mm -hmm. issues.